Welcome to Sunlight. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to just encourage you to download the Sunlight app. Stick around to the end of the service so you can learn a little bit more how to do that. But for now, let's worship together. Welcome to Sunlight Community Church's online worship service. My name is Aaron. I'm a pastor here. Uh, look, if you are, if it's your first time connecting with us and, and tuning into one of these things, we want you to, you know, block out distractions. This is your time with God. Okay, we don't want you to just watch this worship service. We want you to worship in this worship service. Okay, so it would be very helpful to you if you tuned out all the distractions. You know, turned off Facebook, turned off all that kind of stuff, and just dial in with us. Let me pray for us to get this worship service started. But this is really for you. Also, if it's your first time, uh, please stay till the end, and so you find out ways you could get connected with our church, so that we could pray for you, that we could, you know, just try to be with you, you know, through this medium. Uh, we would love for you to for you to get connected with us even further. Anyway, let me pray for us and let's start the service. Heavenly Father, I pray for this service. I pray for anyone who's watching um, online right now that you would just uh, speak to them in powerful ways during the music and during the sermon, Lord. I pray that you just be continually with them. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You are here Moving in our midst I worship you I worship you you are here working in this place i worship you i worship you you are here moving in our midst i worship you i worship you you are here Working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, cause you're a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning every heart. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, turning lives around, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, mending every heart, I worship I worship you, cause you're a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, sing it out, oh, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are, and that is who you are.
you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop Oh, even when I don't see it, you're working. See it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We make a miracle work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a oh, we make a Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, and that is who you are. Hola, mi nombre es Jasmine Granada y este es mi papá, John Granada, de Sunlight, Miami. Hoy encendemos la cuarta vela de Adviento. Isaías 43, 1b, 4 a 5 dice, No temas, que yo te he redimido, te he llamado por tu nombre. Tú eres mío. A cambio de ti entregaré hombres, y a cambio de tu vida entregaré pueblos. Porque te amo y eres ante mis ojos precioso y digno de onda. No temas, porque yo estoy contigo. La primera vela nos recordó la esperanza. La segunda vela nos recordó pa la paz. La tercera vela de al viento nos recordó el gozo. La cuarta vela es la vela del amor. Que la luz de la esperanza, la paz, el gozo y el amor arda en nuestros corazones todos los días.
we have reached the center part of our worship service where we open up God's word and we see what God has to say to us. Uh, you and me, I believe that he's preaching to, to both of us that we, we've got a message from God and we want to listen to what God has to say. Uh, and so we've been in a series called Pursuit of the King where we are looking at Jesus through the lens of different kings throughout the Bible. Uh, we were talking about Solomon and David. Now we are on King Hezekiah. Bless you. Bad joke. Anyway, uh, we're talking about King Hezekiah, and <laughs> if uh, if you are with me, please turn to Second Chronicles. That's where we are going to spend most of our time there. Uh, you know, during this worship service. Now we're going to be talking about how God brings us peace in the middle of our darkest nights, in the middle of our fiercest battles. And I want to ask you a question: What does peace look like to you? Peace might look something different, but uh, for me, it might look like uh, you know. You know, sitting on the beach, sunset, nothing is wrong. I got a little Mai Tai in my hand. I've got, I've got just like a sunset, beautiful landscape. Everything is perfect with the world. Uh, peace might look something different. Peace might look like uh, your kids just, you know, you wake up every morning, you walk down the stairs, you walk out to the living room, and the kids have made you some coffee, made you breakfast. Hey, Dad. Hey, Mom. Here, you know, just, mm, this is peaceful. You know, a lot of times we think that peace is exactly everyone acting and everything acting exactly how we want, like nothing surprising us. Everything is going the way we want it to go. But that is very untrue, right? Actually, nothing ever goes the way exactly we want it to go. And so if we want to, if we're looking for peace and that's our vision of peace, we're probably, we're probably looking for something that doesn't exist or at least won't exist uh, on this side of glory. It's, it's just interesting that we think that that's what peace is. No, God, when God talks about bringing peace, he brings peace in the middle of just the worst possible situations. I'm going to put a, a, a visual up here on the screen. and Maybe you've seen this before, but it's a picture of all this like water and turbulent rain and, and all this stuff coming down. But I want you to zoom in here and we're gonna zoom in and you see here, actually there's a little dove, it's actually a little pixelated, right? It's this little dove in the cleft of the rock, even if all this stuff is going on around it, it's, set, it's just sitting there peaceful and abiding and just relaxing. And that is what real peace is. It, the God's peace that has in your life that he wants to give you in your life is that when you, you could walk back into the house, you could walk back into your job and you could walk back into these broken, tumultuous relationships that are just life sucking, broken, just, just, uh, just it drains you type of relationship, but you could walk into it with poise with the peace of God, with love in your heart, and just, just knowing that there's a greater purpose for things. And that's the kind of peace that we're talking about today. That's the kind of peace where, it's the peace where just things are going crazy around you and you still have the peace of God with you that surpasses all kinds of understanding, all that stuff. And so that's what we're really looking for. That's this type of peace that I'm, I hope to promise, at least what God promises to, to, promises to give you today. So we're gonna be looking at um, King Hezekiah, okay? Um, and King Hezekiah, uh, to, before we get into his background, let's, let's set the stage up here. If you didn't know, the nation of Israel, if it's your first time in like Bible history class or whatever, the nation of Israel under King Solomon was one nation. But when King Solomon died, I'm going to put a map up here on the screen. When King Solomon died, uh, the nation was split up into a northern and southern kingdom. The northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And uh, pretty much after King Solomon, there ever, pretty much every single king was just evil, especially in the north. North just had no, no good kings. In the south, uh, they had four good kings. You know how southerns do. Anyway, southern hospitality, right? Anyway, the, there were four, about four or five good kings, and you know, you can make the case for other ones. Um, and one of those kings was the king we're talking about today, Hezekiah. Okay, bless you. I make that joke every time someone says that. Anyway, uh, the king Hezekiah, but before we do that, we, before we look at him, I want to look at his dad. I want to look at his dad, evil king Ahaz. You know how uh, people grow up with good, with like awesome pedigrees and all this stuff. Hezekiah did not grow, grow up with that. And so we're going to look at King Ahaz, and I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of that. King Ahaz was a terrible king, okay? Just awful. He worshiped foreign gods. He led people astray from God. He, he practiced child sacrifice. He would take his children and sacrifice it 
on an altar and you know kill them. They would actually take children and put them on on heated pots and just wait for the child to burn up and and die. I mean, it's a little gruesome, but that's exactly what would happen. He made altars to other gods. Uh, he closed down the temple. Actually, the temple was a place where God went to, or people went to worship God, and that God would meet them there. He closed it down. So he pretty much eradicated all worship of God in the nation, the southern nation of Judah. And so this continued for 16 years, 16 years, over a decade of of just turning away from God, being led. He was actually so wicked and evil that the people were just so far from God and that when he died, they didn't even bury him with the other kings. He didn't even deserve that spot of recognition. So Hezekiah, now King Hezekiah, became king. And guess what? He He was at the age of 25. I don't know about you, but 25 years old, at least for me, I was a dummy. Okay, I was dumb. I said it. I was a dummy. I didn't know what I was doing. Still kind of don't know what I'm doing. But at 25 years old, you're not really fit, possibly not fit to run and rule a whole kingdom. And yet uh, Hezekiah showed great wisdom and, and, and uh, understanding and closeness with God. And we'll see that today. So if you're with me, 2 Chronicles 29 I'm going to start here, verse 1. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king and reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Okay, so he was a good ruler. Started at 25, not a dummy. And uh, he did three major things. He did a lot more than this, but I want to focus in on three things. One, he reopened the temple. Temple, Second Chronicles 29.3. Check out how fast he did it. In the first month of the first year of his reign, he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. Okay, this was the first thing he did. Okay, I don't know what happened to Hezekiah. Like, he had such a bad influence, a bad dad, that like maybe he saw his dad sacrificing his brothers and sisters on the altar and he just didn't get to him or something. I don't know what happened. But he, he did not take after his dad. Actually, in the first month of the first year, actually in 16 days, he reopened the temple. He started getting the priests coming back. He started getting them ceremonially clean. He started getting sacrifices going. He's like, first thing I need to do when I'm king is to reopen this temple. And that's what he did. Uh, the second thing he did was he restored corporate worship. Check out in verse 27 of chapter 29. Hezekiah gave the order to sacrifice the burnt offering on the altar. As the offering began, singing to the Lord began also, accompanied by trumpets and the instruments of David, king, is, king of Israel. The whole assembly bowed in worship while the musicians played and trumpets sounded. All this continued until the sacrifice of burnt offerings was completed. He started worship services again. He was like, everyone, come, come up in here. We're playing Great I Am. Okay, bring the sheep, bring the goat. Okay, everyone, we are singing these songs over and over and over again because God is good. We need to remember how God is good and good to us. And we've, we've, we haven't done this. Remember, they haven't done this for 16 years. Could you imagine not going to church, not worshiping, not singing to God for 16 years, actually being forced to worship some weird God who's taking child sacrifices and he's like got this bull on his head and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's wild. And so this is what why Hezekiah was so good that this was the second thing. He restored corporate worship. And I should just say that uh, this is so important. Um, it, it's so important that I, I wish that you and I were here together uh, during this time and, and, and worshiping together. Corporate worship is so important. And this is what we have for right now, that we have this, we have this right? The, the you know invention of technology and internet and all that stuff. But to worship with a church family, with your church, with God's family, you know, like, that is so important, and, and we see that in Hezekiah, how important corporate worship is. Now, I'm not trying to make the case or whatever um, of anything political or whatever you want to have. I'm just making the case that, look, God ordains corporate worship. It, it is fully ordained here, and whether that can be accomplished via Zoom or via in person, uh, as long as you're wa- worshiping with the body of believers, you're stepping into something that God has for you that, that taps deeper into who you are. To ignore that, if you're a Christian flying by, flying by yourself, you're like a little thumb wiggling along the ground out there. Like, who, that's weird, right? You want to be a thumb connected to the body, right? You want to be, a, uh, you want to be connected to the body of believers. The third thing he did was he restarted uh, 
the, the celebration of the Passover. Okay, the Passover is one of the biggest, if not the biggest time of celebration during the nation of Israel. It, it talks about how God has delivered his people, how God rescues his people, how God loves his people. And uh, this was all forgotten. This was all forgotten under Ahaz. But Hezekiah brought that thing all the way back around as we read in uh, chapter 30. And we'll just, there's a whole bunch of it, but we could go from six to nine. At the king's command, this is Hezekiah, of course, couriers went throughout Israel and Judah with letters from the king and his officials, uh, which read, okay, so pause. He sent out letters to people in the other nation, right? The northern nation of Israel. He's like, hey, we're going to celebrate Passover, okay? We're going to start this thing up again. And you guys uh, haven't been celebrating just like we haven't, but we're going to do this up again. And so watch this. People of Israel, return to the Lord the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may return to you who are left, who have escaped from the hand of kings of Assyria. Do not be like your parents. And he's talking about his dad, right? And your fellow Israelites who were unfaithful to the Lord, the God of your ancestors, so that they made them an object of horror as you see. Do not be stiff-necked as your ancestors were. Submit to the Lord. Come into his sanctuary, which he had consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. If you return to the Lord, then your fellow Israelites and your children will be shown compassion by their captors and will return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. He will not, face, uh, he will not turn his face from you if you return to him. This is what Hezekiah was doing. He was saying, repent, come back. Repent, come back to God. Y'all are acting wild. We were acting wild. We were worshiping all these nonsense gods. Um, I don't know who you are out there. I can't, there's nothing here, but I need to say the same thing to you. I mean, this is, this is as applicable to you as it is to me and to anyone else in all of history. If you're watching this 10 years from now or whatever, look, turn back to God. I don't know where you are. I don't know how far you've drifted from God. And, and, and I know this is not for everyone, but this is only for that one person, for someone out there. You need to hear this message. God wants you to turn back to him. And guess what? He will not turn away from you. He will not turn his face from you if you return to him. So Hezekiah was a uh, reigning king and this was his MO. He's trying to bring people back. This is the funny thing. The, the time of the Passover had just finished. It was like a month or two later. And then Hezekiah's like, we got to celebrate the Passover. And he's like, I don't care if it's the right time. We're going to celebrate the Passover right now. And so they started celebrating. It's about a week long. They got, they got so hyped up on that Jesus juice, right? They got so hyped up on the spirit. They were so like, it was like a, it was like a religious revolution, a spiritual, uh, you know, revolution at the time. They were like, you know what? Let's celebrate the Passover one more time, one more again. Let's get it go. You know what I mean? It was like, they, they were so enamored with God. They entered into corporate worship for seven days. They had to do it again for another seven days. Um, and then 2 Chronicles 30, 26 says this, There was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the days of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, there had, nothing, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. Look, if you return to God, if you worship, you praise Him, there will, there will be nothing like it that you can experience like that in your life. We could turn to a lot of these other things to worship. But Hezekiah, God is saying to you, you got to return to him. You got to return to him. He was doing everything right. But you know how you'd be doing everything right and you're like living life. But then trouble still hits you. Like you're, you're like, oh man, I love God. I'm living life for God. Bam. Uh-oh, some kind of struggle, some kind of war. A lot of people get this misconception. Hey, if I live life for God, I'll have a life that's easy with God. That's not true. Actually, some of the people who live life closest to God had the hardest, most afflicted lives. Look at Jesus, right? He was, a, he was God, and he had the hardest life. Anyway, Hezekiah, in line, was refocusing to God. And what happens? The Assyrians come in, and they take over. This is war. So... One of the things that uh, Hezekiah did was he stopped paying taxes. Now, you know and I know that if we stop paying taxes, boy, the, the government will come and took, 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 war against you, right? Uh, that's what happened here. Hezekiah stopped paying taxes to an Assyrian king. 
who took over the northern uh, kingdom. He said, I'm not paying taxes to someone who does not worship God. And so he stopped paying taxes. He rebelled. Um, and so Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, he came, that's, uh, that's missing on the McDonald's menu, actually. Uh, anyway, uh, he came in and he was the king of Assyria and he's like, you're going to pay me these taxes. And he came in and he took over 42 cities of Judah. Actually, uh, this is known on, uh, on uh, what's called Sennacherib's prism. And um, we'll, we'll come back to this. I got a picture for that, but let me, let me come back to that, actually. Uh, Sennacherib uh, came in and he waged war on, on, on Hezekiah. And he actually encircled and, and siege, put under siege the kingdom, or the, sorry, the city of Jerusalem. And here's Sennacherib's prism. And here's the funny thing. People think that the Bible is just a bunch of rules, right? Do this, don't do that. You know, it's not an archaeological book, historical book, but it is. And the, the people we talk about are real people, real rulers, real kings, real monarchs, real kingdoms, real places in the world. And so this is one of the things where we look at, it's, it's like a tablet or a prism talking about the king of Assyria and, and how he had Jerusalem under siege. And he said that Hezekiah was like a caged bird. Like I, and it even says that he didn't take the city, but he was like a caged bird. And it's just interesting how that is just, you know. It's just real. And so when he was under siege, or before that he was under siege, Hezekiah did three things to prepare for this. One, he built something called the broad wall. Here's a picture of it right here. It's the dotted line all around. Um, and he expanded the kingdom of Israel so that people who were fleeing the Assyrians in those other 42 cities could come here and take shelter. Okay. The second thing he did is uh, Hez he built Hezekiah's tunnel. It's actually kind of an engineering marvel. He carved his way through stone, right? And he just kind of right through stone. And he made a tunnel connecting uh, different waterways so that he brought water into the city. He knew that his city was going to be under siege. So he brought water into the city so that uh, they could survive. Now, if you didn't know that a siege is actually very devastating. It's not when an attacking invading army comes in, they don't immediately take over because the defenses are too strong. They just kind of wait out there and they wait you out. They've cut off all supplies and provisions, no food. So they wait for people to starve to death, um, all kinds of stuff. And so it's a bad, it creates a bad environment for a very long time. The third thing he did was he gathered, Hezekiah gathered the military officers and encouraged them with these words. And maybe you could read these into your own lives. Second Chronicles 32, 6 through 8. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before, before him in the square at the city gate and encouraged them with these words. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because the king of Assyria and, and the vast army with them. For there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is the only the arm of flesh. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said. I need you right now to know that God fights your battles. God fights your battles. That, that should be like a, a weight lifted off. If, you, if someone's talking to you about whatever struggle they're facing, whatever battle they're facing, uh, you need to tell them, hey, God fights your battles. What does that mean? That means you don't have to manipulate, you don't have to manufacture some way out, you don't have to like try to figure this thing out. Like that, whatever you're dealing with, God is with you in the time. And he's going to bring about a conclusion that will be benef only beneficial to you. And I don't know how that answers. I don't know how that ends up. But I know that God's got a plan for you. God's got a purpose for you. That this suffering of this battle isn't meaningless. That he's in the middle of it. So when uh, he, he said that to his officers, when Hezekiah said that to his officers, um, Sennacherib had, the, uh, had Jerusalem under siege. And they just wanted to wait him out. And then this is what Sennacherib did. All right, this is like a... This guy is crazy, right? He, he writes letters and he puts officers at the wall and he taunts them. He says this in 2 Kings 18, 29 through 30. This is what the king says. This is uh, Sennacherib now. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you from my hand. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hands of the king of Syria. He's saying, Y'all Israelites, don't believe your king. I'm coming in and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy the city. I'm going to kill everyone. I'm going to kill you. You better not believe your king. And so this like, this shakes people. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Like, is so, has, has it ever happened to you where 
you know, you just kind of got that influence, that temptation, like, oh, well, God doesn't work. What good is faith? It's been years. Nothing's, God hasn't shown up. And that's that temptation, man. That's the temptation that gets into our heads and that kind of draws our focus away from God. And then it causes more uh, unrest in us that steals our peace. And then, uh, so Hezekiah then hears this. And then he, uh, he goes up and he prays, 2 Kings 19. This is, this is his response to this, this, all these taunts. Hezekiah received the letter from his messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. So he took Sennacherib's letter and he, and he just put it, brought it into the temple. And he said, Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule, ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone, fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. This is how the people of God fight our battles. This is how we do it. We do it in prayer. We do it by turning to God. We do it by just appealing to God's goodness, appealing to saying, God, make yourself known. Not for, not for me, but for you. And that's what, that's what Hezekiah did. And this is how God replied. For sec, uh, 2 Kings 19.32, He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with a shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. God said, I'm going to fight this battle for you. And I'm going to win it. But I'm going to do it. Check that last line. For my sake and for the promises I made for David. Like, you know, this is my name that's on the line. This is my renown. This is me. Like, this guy's attacking me. Now he's, he's not just attacking you, he's attacking me. And this is why I'm going to come up and show up in powerful ways and, and, and save you guys and deliver you guys. God fought that battle. And in 2 Kings 19.35, right after that, he says, the, That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all dead bodies. Exclamation point. Can you imagine? having 185,000 soldiers wanting to kill you for days, shouting at you, taunting you, telling you oh, we're going to kill you, telling you don't turn to God, don't believe Hezekiah, don't, don't do any of that, don't believe any of that. And then you wake up one morning and they're all dead. I'd like to think they were decapitated. I don't know, but I don't know. I was just reading into it. But they were all just dead bodies, just dead bodies. This is crazy. The, like the, the awe and the horror, and the, and the joy, and just like all this mixture of emotions that, was, that would be wrapped up into the waking up in the morning and seeing that God delivered in a powerful way His promises to, to His people. Look, God provides for you. God blesses you, you and me. Um, and He's doing it not because we are awesome and we deserve, but because He's awesome and He deserves the praise and the honor from it. Hezekiah... Uh, they, they, they face this battle with the Assyrians, but you and I have a, have a different battle. We have a battle against uh, we, uh, a certain enemy, our own sin. And this sin brings death. Like it separated us from God. We can't be in God's presence. Our sin equals our death. And yet God, being rich in mercy, decided to intervene again. He decided to intercede again. And so he see, took on human flesh. And he lived the life we were supposed to live, and he died the death we were supposed to die. He, he waged that battle two millennia ago on a hill called Calvary. And when he died on the cross and he rose again, that victory that he earned is now applied to me and to you. There's a difference between uh, Hezekiah and Jesus. We're looking at Hezekiah, but we're trying to look at Jesus in this way. And Hezekiah prayed that God would deliver his people from their enemies so that so that God would be seen as like the one true God. Jesus prayed 
that, and his mission was to deliver his own people. But when Hezekiah prayed, he stepped out of the way so God can deliver his people. When Jesus prayed, he stepped into the way. He died the death we should have died. On the cross, he was crucified for your sins and mine. And through his death and resurrection, uh, sin and death were conquered. Our true enemies, sin and death. And uh, every, now, now we have that access to God. We've been delivered from our own, you know, the punishment of our own sins. And here's the thing. There's a vital difference between Hezekiah and, and, and Jesus. And I want to make that distinction clear. And it's found in the taunts of the Assyrians. When they said, Hezekiah cannot deliver you from my hand, they were right. Only God can. Only Jesus. Jesus stepped in the way. Um, and while Hezekiah was interceding on the people's behalf, he had to step out of the way. But Jesus interceding. He stepped into the way. And look, let's, let's close here. Just because, just because you follow God doesn't mean life will go easy. There's battles wage, waging around you. There's, you're at siege. You could follow uh, and do everything right. You could follow God. You could try to turn people around. But scripture doesn't say that no weapon uh, will be formed against you. It says that no weapon formed against you will prosper. Scripture doesn't say, okay, I'm going to detour you away from the shadow or the valley of shadow and death. It says in the middle of shadow and death, you will not fear. I will not fear. You will comfort me. Jesus, say doesn't, Jesus doesn't say like, hey, you're not going to have trouble in this world. He says, there will be trouble in this world, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Jesus didn't come to bring peace absent from the battle. He came to bring peace inside the battle, in, during the siege. Look, I asked on Facebook, hey, what is a battle you're facing today? I asked people, what, what, in one word, tell me a battle you're facing. And uh, if, if you don't mind... Type in the comments below. Uh, I'll go through this video and I'll pray for those, those, those battles. And I'll, I'll try to be, you know, at my best to pray with you, to be with you. But rest assured, God is with you in these battles. And these are the, these are the ones that I saw. Dementia. Co-parenting. An or, unorganized life. Financial burdens. Single parenthood. Insecurity. Fear of losing a loved one. Health. Trust. Miscarriage. But I don't know how God will answer your battle here on earth. But in whatever way, I know that God will restore it. Your battle here on earth, it's a, it's a smaller battle of the bigger cosmic battle that was waged on, on a hill called Calvary. But this battle, you're, you're, or multiple battles, you know, these, it's the worst thing is when these are all stacked. These battles, these under siege, it's only the middle of the night. This is the, when we wait for God, when we wait for Christ to return again, that is the morning when victory will come. That is the, that is the morning we wait for. When we, Christians forget that we're waiting for Jesus to come again. He won the victory already and he will make it complete when he returns again and everything we've lost will be restored. All the heartbreak will be healed. All the health things will be mended. All of it, all of it, we get it all back. Until then, this is how we fight our battles. We pray. That's how we get peace. In the middle of the battle, in the middle of the siege, God will give us, bring us peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for anyone who is in the middle of a siege right now of life. I pray for anyone who is fighting a battle, Lord. I pray that you would just be with them. God, I know you're, you've already won the battle, Lord, but we, sometimes we forget and we, we have these things that we're dealing with, these stresses, Lord, these, oh, these, these pressures on us, Lord. Remind us sweetly of how you have won the victory and you'll win it again. Remind us sweetly of how you are with your people in the middle of the darkest nights. Strengthen us, encourage us during this time. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for joining us in this uh, online worship service. Look, if you have uh, any prayer requests or you turn your life to Christ, please you know, text the number below. We would like to get connected with you. We want to, we want to pray for you. We want to connect you to a wider church family. And I want to send you off with this blessing. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, may the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And we all said, amen. What 
a powerful message. As I said earlier, remember to download the Sunlight app. It's easy to do. All you need to do is go to Google Play or the App Store if it's an iOS, and all you have to do is type in Sunlight Church and click download. It's that easy to stay connected with our news, find sermons, you can even give right there in the app. As Christians, we're asked to respond to a giving God by giving of ourselves, which like I said, you can do right through the app. Also, you can stay connected to us by texting 772-277-7072. Let us know of any concerns or anything we can be praying for you about. Also, make us aware if you gave your life to Christ. We want to know about it and celebrate with you. And finally, I challenge you to subscribe and to share this video with one person this week as a digital missionary.